Hey guys and gals, Jack Spierko here with another episode of Miyagi Mornings. Uh, for those of you listening to this in podcast form, this might be one you want to go by, find the, the recap episode at the survivalpodcast.com and pull up the video on Odyssey and take a look at the video. I'll be referencing some things behind me in this video. You won't absolutely need them to kind of understand what I'm talking about, but the reason I set up over here and got way up against my chicken house, which is right there where I'm punching it, is because it should help, right? And I'm up against the chicken house because of the lighting, because the sun's blazing and that's not good for cameras. So what I want to talk to you about today is function stacking, and I'm, I'm working on a new system and like all of the design is not done yet, which is great because it allows me to start explaining what function stacking is and how you should analyze what you're doing and why you're doing it. So let's start off with what I'm doing here in the first place. I've learned this year already, it's not even halfway through the first month, I've learned this year that the protein in a water plant called water hyacinth in the leaf is as high or higher than soybean, depending on how the soybean's grown. I've also learned that almost all livestock, and certainly ducks and chickens, which are the primary livestock that I own that will be using this, eat it. In fact, they love it. I've also learned that when they don't, what they don't eat makes exceptional compost. I've learned all those things. So I said to myself, self, how do you use these things since you're familiar with this plant and you were going to be using it in some of your pond systems this year anyway because you decided to go away from water lettuce because it caused problems that you don't want to deal with ever again because you don't like dead fish. So myself answered myself and it said, hey, why don't you harness the fact that this plant is also being used to treat duck water, duck wastewater, in large commercial duck operations, and it's improving the quality of the water that comes out the other end by about 85%. And I thought, well, so if I had duck wastewater that went through this plant, I would be in good shape. So then I thought about it and said, well, the problem with that is all your ponds are up high so the ducks can't get in them because you don't want that. And the last thing you need to be doing is you know, putting duck affluent through your beautiful Miyagi ponds, right? Because then it would be Miyagi skank mornings instead of Miyagi mornings, and we don't want that. So what we need is a system that's designed to rapidly flush through and do other things. Well, right behind me, it's kind of hard to see there because of the sun sitting it, you'll see a big square. That is a fiberglass container. It's what my big wicking beds are built on that I've done in other videos for you with. These things actually used to hold molasses to feed cattle. So they're really rugged, really strong. I may hit them with a coat of um, epoxy or something like that, just as a little insurance policy since they're so old. But it, probably, right now, probably, I'm not sure yet, three of them are gonna go back there. They hold a bit over 100 gallons a piece with enough freeboard, that's space in the top, to do what I wanna do. So it's about 300 gallons of capacity. That's gonna go there. You see right there, you can see kind of the outline of a hole. This is my test hole. I don't know if this is going to all work the way that I think. So the easy solution is I'm gonna sink one of those in the ground as deep as I can. And right here, I've got a little more to work with. There's some buildup up high here, but as you guys know, my property has a rock layer. I'm already in a chunk rock there, but it looks like I can get at least 10 inches. I'd like 12. If I can get the chunk rock out before I hit the slab, and if I can get 12 inches there, I can probably get 12 inches to each side of it, and my three tanks go 12 inches in the ground. That means the lip will only be eight inches high, and I took my laser level yesterday and went up that way, up to the higher side, as to where I wanna put 50 gallon stock tank or tanks. I haven't decided yet. And how much I need to elevate them, and how much I need to create dirt ramps for the ducks to get in them and out of them, etc. And all the math works if I can get 12 inches. I can make it work with 10, but it would work much better with 12. Before I go forward, I want to know which one of those I'm dealing with. So now we can start to understand the three function rule or the three reason rule. I actually like three reason rule better than the three function rule. Bill Mollison, when he teaches PDCs, or when he used to teach PDCs, because unfortunately a few years he passed away. He's the co-founder of Permaculture, for those that don't know, said that anytime you put anything anywhere on a property in a design, you should be able to give at least three reasons why you chose that location. And if you can't give three reasons, there might be three good reasons, but you don't know what they are, so you can't effectively design the rest of the system and properly function stack. So let's start off with why that hole that I'm using as a test hole is where it is, and what are the reasons behind it, and how will that relate to function stacking. So the first reason is, I need to be downgrade enough from where the tank that the ducks are going to go swim in every day, poop in, and that tank has to drain with no pumps, by gravity, and that's about the 
furthest downgrade I can go and still get enough drop to make that happen with no energy. That's one reason, and that's a good effing reason. Reason number two, it needs to be high enough in the landscape to do the other part of what I'm about to explain to you, and if I go any further south than that, it may not work. Reason number two. Reason number three, I want it far enough from the fences that if I need to maintain stuff in here with my lawn tractor, my lawn tractor can fit around that system and cut grass without having to get in there with a weed trimmer any more than necessary right up against the fence. That's reason number three. Reason number four, you see this big building, that's, you can't see it, but I'm touching it, it's how close it is to the frame, this building that the birds are in. I don't want it behind here because I want sun on it because I want rapid growth of my plants. I want part shade, not full shade. If I put it behind this building for a lot of the day, it will get full shade and that's not what I'm looking for in this particular system. If I were growing fish in it, I might get it well into this shade to keep the water temperatures lower. The only fish that are going to go in there are probably gambrosia mosquito fish. That's about it just to keep the mosquitoes from being a problem. Mosquitoes will not be a problem. That's reason number four. Reason number five, I plan on trying if I can get depth because as I come this way toward the camera, I might not be able to go as deep. I need all three of these tanks to be the same height. If I can space them out, I want them spaced out far enough, about four to five feet to put an arch using a cattle panel in between them. So I'll have three tanks, two arches. On those arches, I can take wicking containers, which are just basically a cinder block sitting in this tank with a, a, a flower pot with half gravel and half soil sitting in the water line that gets wicking fed, and I can grow vines up over there to create more shade. That gives me my partial shade. It gives me an additional yield. It gives shade for the ducks to hang out in. When I let them in here, they won't be in here that often, but that's another reason that that goes in that location, right? There's, there's more, but I want you to sort of understand, like, the location was carefully chosen. It also kind of defaulted, but once it defaulted to this area, then we started thinking, what are all the other things we want to do here? Now, the function stacking works like this, because there's another reason it's there. Just on the, on the other side of the fence, so there's a fence behind me that separates this whole area from where the ducks usually are allowed to range out onto the back side of my, or the front side of my property. So this is kind of a walled off area, we call it the west pasture, because it's the furthest west one acre on the three acre property. And it's cross fenced off of the other two. So they can only come in here when I let them in here like they're in here today, right? Now, that means that what I want to be able to do is take this water plant that will be growing in these ponds and feed it to my ducks. Well, all I have to do is take a pitchfork, and if I stand right between that hole and that fence, I cannot move. I can take my pitchfork and I can go in and I can get plant and I can just turn around and dump. Pitchfork, turn around and dump. And I can do three or four pitchforks worth a day, barely taking a step and put the, the, the vegetation over the fence. Now, what's going to go on the other side of the fence? One of my patented, right, big squares of cinder blocks that makes a pit to contain stuff. So they come in, they eat whatever they don't eat, compost. I continue to add compost to that as well. And so now I'm feeding ducks high protein, I'm filtering their wastewater, and I'm feeding them uh, that material, and I'm making compost, which can be returned to the system. That's only just the beginning. These tanks, whenever I let go the flow from above, which will be you know about 100 gallons of duck poop water, or about one third of the total, these tanks will overflow into a system of pipes that will go downgrade from here, and I haven't decided exactly how I'm gonna do it yet. Tune into the podcast today to hear more about where I'm going with this, but there'll be somewhere between four and six trees that this water will fertigate and water, and it will be infiltrated into this entire slope through some sort of microswale system. That's another reason that it's there, and that's another function that it serves, and those trees will either just provide shade, maybe they'll provide fodder. I mean, there's all types of things. I haven't even decided on the variety of trees yet. This is another thing where each tree and where it is, at least three reasons and three functions, okay? This is a campground now. This used to be kind of all grown in and gnarly, I want it to stay open, so I have to think about how I design it so it's easy to mow and maintain. Having four to six big trees here eventually, and this is very fertile because all the nutrient flow from the duck holding area has been seeping into it for seven years now. This will grow even though it's shallow soils. It just keeps going from there. Now I've got water from my well right there. I can put in two just kind of cheap back and forth sprinklers, run them maybe two days a week, and then take a drought tolerant, which it won't be drought conditions at all over here, right, Billy Roy? 
a drought tolerant, rapid growing feed crop for my ducks and chickens in the form of something like Japanese millet, I can just broadcast that and the first time I do that, I'll go ahead and throw about five bales of straw out here as a scatter mulch and these little birds will not be allowed in here until that crop comes into harvest size, which I won't harvest. I don't need to do the harvest. So now we've got the trees growing, we've got all the flows going, all of that's going, and now we're growing millet. So the millet will only take about six to seven weeks to mature and be ready for harvest by the birds. I will then let them in here if they go in those pond tanks. I don't care. It's designed to deal with their wastewater anyway. Okay? No problem, because they're only going to be here a few days. They're going to mow down that millet, and as soon as they're done, another crop of millet, maybe buckwheat, whatever's next, I'll come in and I'll just broadcast that, and then I'll take my scythe and I'll drop the straw from the millet onto the next, and I'll keep doing that. When we get into fall next year, I'll throw down a really winter hardy crop like triticale or barley and do the same thing. If you've read Masanobu Fukuoka's work, it's kind of like that. And this area will continue to get more fertile and more productive with almost no work, very little input, but it's only because I have been thinking about this for weeks and I'm not done yet. You know, they talk about not getting analysis paralysis and there's a point to that. There's also a point where you mature enough of the designer and you're doing something that is a significant keystone component to really think about it. It's not trying to talk yourself out of it. It's not looking for excuses. What it is comes down to how do I maximize this? Because the way this system will work on a daily level of maintenance, I will walk out and I will open a valve to whichever two of the two swales I want to fill, and I will open a valve at the tank. And you know what will happen? It'll drain. It'll drain into those tanks, overflow, and go into that swale. And there's some cool shit going on down there. It's not a typical swale, by the way, if you're tuning in the podcast here today. When that's done, I'll close that valve. And I'll close the valve from the, that I just drained and open the other one so it's all ready to go for the next day and go to the, the different one. So it's each swale one, you know, one day on, one day off. And I'll turn a, a spigot that'll be sitting right over those tanks, which will be plumbed together. And I'll turn it on and it'll fill up and I'll turn it off. And then I'll pick up my duck eggs while that's happening and, and go back in the house. I could even, and I might, put a float valve in there, right? And a valve to cut it off. And that way when I turn it on, It'll shut itself off so I don't forget about it, but I'll shut it off during the day because I want the ducks to, ducks to continue to splash and can continue to drain down on the water supply. We actually want that water to prob probably not do that because the other thing that's going to have my wife loves willow trees. Well, right where those tanks are up there, I'll plant a willow tree so just all the bypass splash will fertigate and water that willow tree and we'll never have to touch it. And that's in their holding area, which then gives them a great big thing that they like, which is shade, which also helps with evaporation and heating of their water that's going into the system in the first place. Do you see how this starts to work? Anyway, I'm at 13 minutes. That's long for an episode of Miyagi Mornings. But this is the way, guys. When you're wondering how do you build systems, and like I said yesterday, you can do a lot of these things. Maybe not quite this, but you can do a lot of things like this. You can micro-size this system, and you can do this on a quarter to a half of an acre. Get yourself... Here's another thing I want to throw at you today, and we'll talk about this maybe tomorrow. I'm not sure. Access the land. When I say get on land, I don't necessarily mean you need to go out and buy five acres, three acres, two acres, whatever. Go somewhere, get out of these beltway cities, start building systems like this, and there's lots of ways to access land without actually owning it. Start thinking like rich people. There's nothing wrong with thinking like a rich person. Not all rich people are bad, guys. Like that class warfare shit, that'll kill you, right? Poor people want to own things. Rich people want to control things. That's my final thought of the day. I'll catch, with you, catch up with you again tomorrow.